I'm a writer. I know dialogue. That's a fountain of conversation, man. That's a geyser. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, provocative. Oh, daddy, stand back, man. Woo! Rock and roll! Welcome to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast online at bookedonrock.com, where you can find every episode of Booked on Rock, along with links to your favorite listening platforms. Exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites are there, along with the latest rock book releases. It's another chapter in the Dialogue series, a chill and chat with authors, fellow podcasters, listeners, and more. Author Jeff Apter is this episode's guest. He is the author of over 30 books about Australian music and musicians and was on staff at Rolling Stone for several years. He's here to talk about his books on ACDC, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, The Cure, Neil Finn of Crowded House, who's now with Fleetwood Mac, Jeff Buckley, and his brand new book just released. It's the first and only definitive biography of country music artist Keith Urban. So let's get right to it. Here is Jeff Apter. Hello, Jeff, out there in Australia. It's Eric from the U.S. Great to speak with you. I've been looking forward to this. It is tomorrow where you are. It's it's like a time machine. I love talking yeah, to people absolutely. in Australia. Tomorrow's sunny and sunny and hot. So <laughs> no problem. we're going to talk a little later about all the bands that you've written about: ACDC, The Cure, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Neil Finn, just to name a few. But yeah, we got this brand new book out on Keith Urban. The first and only definitive biography of Keith Urban, and there's a great story you start the book with that took place in 1998. He was just yeah, a face in the right. crowd back then. Okay, tell us yeah. about this and how you got involved was, with the book. Yeah, it was such a it was a, just a, a random experience to be honest. I was living in the states and I was doing a lot of documenting various Australian artists, you know, success or otherwise in America. You know, their 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 own particular journeys. And I wanted to go to Fanfare in Nashville. Now, anybody who doesn't know about Fanfare, it's it's like um, the Hajj for Muslims or it's like going to Lourdes for Catholics. You know, it's this ridiculous, it's like pilgrimage. It's a country music pilgrimage. And when I went there, they used to hold it at the Speedway, which was a little bit out of town. I think now they do it in a, a, a venue downtown, like a purpose-built venue in Nashville itself. But this was a bit out of town. And there was an Australian contingent there. You know, like it's a, sorry, it's a week-long festival of country music. It's basically the biggest promotional tool for every record company in Nashville to get their new artists and their established artists and anybody with a new record in front of a crowd. And they do these sort of, you know, 20 minute sets. It's like an infomercial, basically. I was there covering, there was four Australian artists playing a showcase. And to be honest, they, you know, they didn't stand a chance. You know, the, the idea that you could crack Nashville by doing, you know, a 20 minute showcase at the Speedway on a Wednesday afternoon. And then a, you know, a little acoustic gig at the Bluebird. Um, that's not how it works, but I was there to cover them and, and to provide a bit of color and do this story. And I was talking to a friend of mine backstage and he was a manager of a, an, an act there. And he said, Oh, there's, there's Keith, Keith Urban. All oh, right. And he was just a face in the crowd. And, um, and he said to me, and this is, you know, don't tell a journalist this. He said, Keith's done it tough, you know? And it, suddenly I was like, ding, 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 ding. What do you mean? What do you mean? You've got to give me more details, you know, tell me this story. Oh, yeah. And I met him briefly, but you know, he wasn't performing. He was just catching up with some people he knew from Australia. And I found out this great backstory about how Keith had been in America, in and out of America for about 10 years, but based there since the early nineties, had a band called the ranch. Uh, they were managed by Miles Copeland, you know, the manager of the police that was had him on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you well, go. Yeah. Ago, they were, yeah. They were really a great band. They were this really hard rocking country three piece. Um, with Keith out front really shredding on the guitar and a really solid band. They've been touring around. They got a deal with Warners. They recorded a debut record, but it just it just went to hell. I mean, they were you know it was that classic case of making their first album, trying desperately to please their bosses, um, who were then saying that song's great. Now go and record it with a fiddle. Go and record it with a new guitar solo. And, you know, the, if you look at the credits of that album, which surprisingly stands up pretty well, um, they used every single studio in Nashville and, you know, within the, you know, uh, probably a uh, hundred kilometer radius of the city. <laughs> and songs were recorded over and over again and they brought in different musicians. It was just a mess and it all fell apart. You know, they, they, were, the, they were getting great praise from fellow musos who come and see them play in town. Like they were really 
a crack band, really an ace band, but they didn't fit in. And this is the period in country music, what are we, late 90s. You know, Garth Brooks is still huge. Shania Twain is still huge. It's a very country kind of pop sound. Garth Brooks is doing all those big shows, you know, doing, well, we just talked about Kiss off air, doing kind of Kiss-like shows with pyros and the whole drama. Here's this rock and three piece playing little clubs and really try, really impressing players. They weren't, you know, they weren't really pulling a big audience and it just fell apart. It just fell apart. And uh, Keith, when I met him briefly that first time, I think he'd just been through rehab. You know, he really fell apart. But when I went back to Australia soon after, you know, my curiosity was really piqued. It's like I knew Keith Urban in Australia through country music circles uh, and, you know, basically he'd left. He'd gone to America and, you know, no one was really sure how it was, it was going. Gradually, I went back to Australia and got a job with Rolling Stone magazine and started to document his rise in America because Australian audiences weren't really aware of what was going on. And it was just great. I was just there at the right time. You know, he got out of rehab. He got a solo deal with Capital. He made all the right compromises. You know, he's a good looking guy. You know, previously he was seen as a, a muso's muso. Well, now they're sort of pushing him into the mainstream and marketing him as a, a heartthrob, a bit of a pinup, you know, but a guy who, when you go and see him, can shred, you know, and really play, play ACDC covers, for God's sakes, you know. So he had this sort of, he had something for everyone. So when I went back to Australia, I just was lucky enough to continue charting his rise in America. He'd come back to Australia quite frequently, once or twice a year, play these little shows with pickup bands. I mean, I saw him play a gig with Rose Tattoo, you know, it was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he just... You know, and really, really, you could tell this guy's career was just building and building and building. And the funny thing about all that is while he's, it's the early 2000s, he's playing to 10, 20,000 people in America, big shows. In Australia, he's still playing small clubs. You know, it made no sense. So while it, it's only now, you know, 20 years down the line, that he's playing big shows, big stadiums in Australia, whereas in America he's been doing it for, you know, 10 years or more. For an Australian success story, his career is almost back to front. You did say he's done it tough, or that's what somebody told you, and that's true. But he would say it's it's those dark detours that got him to where he is now. He came from humble origins. Talk about his childhood days, where he was raised, what kind of relationship he had with his parents. He didn't come from money, that's for sure. No, God, no. He was raised in the methan methamphetamine capital of Australia. You know, this this country town. You know, outside, it, it's a, it's about. I think about an hour out of Brisbane. Brisbane is a capital city, but it's still a big country town. He was raised in an even smaller country town, you know, and the likelihood of him, because he always had this dream of going to Nashville and cracking Nashville in particular, was in very unlikely. I mean, his dad, his dad's job was running the local garbage tip. You know, Keith was a high school dropout. His, um, you know, his performances, he started playing in shopping centres and, and then progressed to the same kind of beer barns. He left. He started playing professionally at 15, and he was playing the same kind of beer barns and, you know, um, well, I guess sort of the Australian equivalent of honky-tonks when he was 15. And these are the same places where ACDC and In Excess and Rose Tattoo and all these bands learned their trade. So, you know, there's a good history about playing in these, these venues because they're tough, you know? Audiences are pretty busy getting drunk, you know, and you've got to really hit them over the head to capture their attention. He became really, really good at doing that. So, you know, he's he's been doing this for almost almost 40 years now. His dad was a disciplinarian. He was tough. His dad was pretty tough, yeah. But, but the flip side of that is his dad was obsessed with Americana. He drove big American cars. He dressed, you know, in what he considered American style, wearing a Stetson and things like that. And he loved classic American country music. You know, he was into Glen Campbell and Johnny Cash and Charlie Pride and all those kind of Waylon Jennings, the, the, the standards, you know, the American country songbook. You know, the first concert Keith went to, Brisbane Festival Hall, 1972. He was only three years old and he saw Johnny Cash. And he said, you know, as soon as the lights went down and this single spotlight hit this guy on stage who looked like he was carved out of stone, you know, and this voice comes out, Oh, I'm Johnny Cash. You know, Keith was sold. It was like, I want to do that. I want to be something. I, I don't want to be that guy, but I want to have the same impact that he does. And, you know, that that 
he was basically on that path ever since then. So when he moves to Nashville, that wasn't overnight success. In fact, it was difficult. And this is when he turns to drugs and alcohol to cope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he thought he thought it was a, a you know, a lay down misery. He thought, okay, go to Nashville. I've got it. I have a record deal in Australia, you know. I've I've had some success there. Surely it's transferable, you know, and I and I know this stuff inside out. He knew the music, but he didn't understand the game. And um, you know, it took him years, as I said earlier, to make the right kind of compromises. Early on, you know, early on, he's a young guy, he's full of um vigor and they're probably thinking why would i have to change well you know anybody who's succeeded particularly in nashville because it's a very sort of parochial place you know and there are certain rules of the game that you have to uh, adhere to it's it's very rare that real mavericks succeed in nashville which is why guys like willie nelson ended up going to austin you know getting out of town because it's a very rigid kind of system and um like i said keith came to understand that it wasn't just being a good guitar player and a great singer and a songwriter, you needed to um, fit the mold. You need to do the right videos. You need to work with the right songwriters. You need to get the right management. You need to have the right people at the record company who really are championing you to, you know, the people who go out and sell those records. So, you know, he got to understand how to play that game. It took a few, it took several years. I mean, it really wasn't until the early 2000s um, that he really started to break through. But, you know, there's been other Australian artists who have been there and tried. And uh, there's a great story. There's a guy called James Blundell, who was a big, big star here in Australia, got a deal with Capital. And one of these first recording sessions, an engineer said to him, can you try singing with an American accent? And he said, yeah, I can, but you're not going to like it. And, you know, and yeah. he did it. And the guy and the engineer just said, all right, I got your point. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> His career went nowhere, you know, because you've got to compromise. I mean, yeah, everybody's had to compromise. The Beatles had to compromise, for God's sake. You know, it's just part of the, the business. And like I say, particularly the country music business. Chapter 12 in your book, it's titled Keith Urban is the Australian heartthrob of American country. And the next chapter gets to when Nicole Kidman meets that Australian heartthrob. Uh, but it's Keith who's nervous to talk to Nicole. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's you know, let's talk about opposites attract because uh, so it's an event. Every, it's an annual event called oh God. I hate this. Good day, LA. It's so corny. Yeah. I mean, it'd be like it, what it is. It's a group of successful expat Australians in America who, and it's not just music. It's uh, actors, it's filmmakers, it's uh, business people. It's all kinds of Australians just get together and basically pat each other on the back and say, you know, how much money did you make this year? So they get together and they honour people at these events and and at this particular one in 2005 Keith and Nicole Kidman were two of the honorees but you've got to understand that like I say Keith came from very very you know a uh, working class roots a very rough and tumble kind of upbringing Nicole Kidman is is uh, a-list all the way you know her her father was a I think a neurosurgeon you know her mother was a very uh, well-educated sophisticated member of Sydney society Nicole Kidman was private school educated these people were upscale, uptown, you know. Keith, <laughs> Keith straight off the garbage tip in Caboolture, you know, and he's rough, he's still rough around the edges. He's a guy who had a troubled past with substance abuse and things like that. They were not a very likely couple in a lot of ways. And Keith knew that. He can be, we tried, we like to think of ourselves as kind of classless in Australia, but it's not true. You know, there's very clearly defined levels of, of class you know if you come from some certain parts of sydney you know that that's that person's got money you know that person comes from you know a uh, well-heeled family that was nicole certainly not keith and he was very um he thought we're so different you know we're not gonna there's nothing between us it's not gonna work and but nicole kidman had just come off that weird relationship with tom cruise she was going through that horrible divorce it was all very public and frankly you know, uh, Keith was a, the anti-Tom. You know, he was grounded. He was a working class guy. He was someone who who was um, very not really touched by celebrity in anywhere near the same way as Tom Cruise was, you know. And I guess, although she never stated it openly, he was Keith was probably the perfect person for her at that time, given her circumstances. She wanted someone who was real. 
you know. And you know, of course, he was attracted to her anyway, and it just it just worked. They just connected. I think they were married within eighteen months of meeting, something like yeah. that. Yeah, you know? two thousand and six. They, they got married. almost twenty years later. They're still together. They got a family. They got this great balance. They seem to be able to dip in and out of each other's careers and and sort of accommodate each other. It's it's a really solid relationship. And he was still struggling with his addictions. When and how does he finally get clean and sober? Yeah, well, he'd been, by that time, he'd done two spells in rehab. I, my understanding is not long after they got married, there was just a brief, it might have just been a one drink, you know, it was just a slip. And he realized that he had a lot more to lose now. And boom, went, just checked himself into rehab straight away. And in fact, I think he stayed there for three months. I can only, uh, I can only uh, imagine that the food must have been really good. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, maybe the rooms are comfortable. I don't know. But he just said, I'm going to stay here until I'm confident that I can step out into the outside world and not be tempted anymore. And, you know, that seems to have been the case. So well done him. But it was very early in the relationship, you know. I mean, the the, the whispers were that there was a uh, no screw up clause in their uh, prenup, you know, <laughs> and he screwed up. But, um, you know, he, he owned up to it. He didn't try to hide the fact that he had some kind of, you know, slip and he went and owned it and he spent three months in rehab and came out and, you know, here we are what, 15 years down the line and, you know, he's still right at the top of the pile, as is she, you know, so and they've got a couple of kids. They seem to be able to balance their lives really well. Funny story, when the whole um, Chris Rock, um, uh, 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 Will Smith, brouhaha happened. The slap. Austin, yeah, the slap. Well, Keith and Nicole were at the front, right at the front, at a table, right. right at the front. And a, a guy I know here, a, a broadcaster who knows Keith personally, he said he was watching and he sent him a text as it happened. And he said, hey, man, you're pretty close to the action. And Keith <laughs> texted him back and said, no, man, I'm at ringside. <laughs> oh, that's right. I remember watching the clip. And there's Nicole. Yeah. Like, wow, <laughs> Nicole what's Keith. going on? It must have felt like the days back in the beer barns in Australia, you know, where everybody's up for a fight. He's a regular guy in an, living this irregular life. A friend of mine lives in the same apartment building. Uh, well, when I say a friend of mine lives in the same apartment building, Keith and Nicole have, they own most of an apartment building on the harbour in Sydney. And a friend of mine lives in one of the apartments. I think they own 10. And he said... He's just the guy you see here. You know, he holds the door for you with the lift. You see him down in the gym and the pool. It's a guy in flip-flops and shorts and T-shirt. You know, it's really, there's no pretension. Jeff Apter's here to talk about his brand new book titled Keith Urban. That is out now, right? People can- Yeah, yeah, that's right. This week, you, you, were, you were at the dawn of the release. Yes. And he's here to share some stories from his previous books. ACDC fans are very familiar with- Jeff Apter. You've written a handful of books related to the band members. Yes. Love this band. And you were a ghostwriter for ACDC bassist Mark Evans book, right? Dirty yeah. Deeds, My Life Inside, Outside of ACDC. I want to ask you about your 2021 book on Bon Scott first, and that's mm -hmm. titled Bad Boy Boogie, the true story of ACDC legend Bon Scott. You said in an interview with Australia's The Leader at the time you were promoting this book that Bond should be remembered for what he did while he was alive, not how he died. And you also said that he was the last of the great Larrikins. He was in the last generation of Larrikins who could get away with being Larrikins. Am I pronouncing it Larrikins, right? Larrikins. Yeah, did you, did you need an explanation? A Larrikin is, I'm trying to think of an American, ex, American equivalent. Jokester? Yeah, yeah. But it's sort of, in Australia, it's, it was until, I guess, until political correctness and, and wokeness became a big factor. It was, it was prized, you know, people like Paul Hogan would, is the definitive larrikin. You know, he's a guy who um, could get away with certain things with a bit of a wink and a smile, you know, and, you know, deep down inside, if he's going, if anybody's going to be hurt, it's himself, not anybody else, you know, um, a guy who would look at life as an adventure, you know, right, right. And, and not take himself too seriously. It's really important part of Australian culture not to take yourself too seriously. And, yeah, that you know, is Bon. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going back to the first thing about um, there was an there seemed to be a really obsessive quest to find out how he died. Did he OD? Did this happen? And I mean, who cares? Because if he didn't live the life that he did, 
we wouldn't be talking about him anyway. And I, or I felt it was really unfair. Obviously, the guy's not around to, to challenge accusations and, and suggestions and whispers about how he ended up. It's a tragedy. He died. It's horrible. I'm sure he didn't want to go out. You know, he had a lot left to give. And ACDC, of course, were just on the cusp of exploding. You know, the highway to hell would come out. They were about to go and make back in black, for God's sake. You know, everything was happening for him. So I think it was. it's very unfair to to really delve into that side of of his short, sharp life, you know. I, I, I wanted to write a book that reminded people of just, this guy's funny, you know, a gifted front man, one of the best ever, in oh, my opinion. Yeah, hands you know, down, yeah. Sexy, charismatic, swagger, but didn't take himself too seriously and wrote really funny and quite often very incisive lyrics. My big problem with everything ACDC post Bond is that their lyrics suck. I mean, they haven't written a funny song for 40 years. Yeah, and then and, and Brian actually handed the lyric duties over to up. Malcolm and Angus in the yeah, um, and Angus 80, just 89 writes, or 90. Know, Angus just comes up with catchphrases, right. you know, power up, rock or bust. I mean, this is not long way to the top, highway to hell, crab city in blue, you know. It's got none of that. Bond's wordplay, you know, he said he was a street poet. I love that. You know, he yeah. was. He was the guy, if you gave him a spray can and a, a blank wall, he'd come up with something really clever and funny, you know. But they don't have that anymore, and they haven't had it since he's gone. Um, you know, Brian Johnson's done a great job, but in Australia, we still think of him as the new boy. Oh, yeah, after all these years, yeah. After 40 years. It's 40 like, oh, yeah, he's still a work experience guy. Yeah, he's doing okay. <laughs> but, you know, he's not Bon Scott, you know. I've, I always talk about the story that may be my favorite, the story that Bond would walk around with a bow constrictor around his neck, you know, that was just, that was him just going for a walk. That was him. But what's the one about him calling friends and family members at the Atlantic records offices on oh, their yeah. day? Right? Well, that's, that, that's Larrikinism, you know, 101, you know, he'd go into the office of their American <laughs> record company Atlantic and say, I just want to make a quick phone call. And he's ringing, and this is, this is when it used to cost a lot to make a, what we call ISD, international subscriber dialing. It, it cost a lot to make these calls. Bond would be on the phone all day. You know, oh, I've got to ring my family in, in uh, Fremantle in West Australia. Oh, there's a couple of people in Sydney I've got to catch up with. I should ring the Albert's office in Sydney and catch up with them. You know, he'd be on the phone for hours racking up this bill. But there's a couple of really it. funny, there's a couple of other very funny stories. Um, and this, I, like I, you mentioned Mark Evans, I was really lucky, you know, I um, was an ACDC fan. I was lucky enough to grow up in the 70s here when they were playing, you know, local venues and got to see them in different, you know, really at that early stage with Bon out front. When they tour here, you know, years down the line, they don't do publicity. They don't need to. In all my time at Rolling Stone, I interviewed Angus once and that was it for 15 minutes on the phone. They don't need to promote things because everything sells without promotion and they don't like doing it anyway. So ACDC were here on tour, and I think it was in about 2000, maybe 2010, around there somewhere. And what the local newspapers do is, okay, I'm not going to get Angus on the phone, so let's get someone who's connected with the band. And Mark Evans, uh, for ACDC historians, would know that Mark was the guy, again, to me, was in the classic lineup, you know, with Bon Scott out front, right up to the time just before Highway to Hell. But he was there for, you know, let there be rock and high voltage and a long way to the top. You know, Rage. Is he on Power yeah, Rage? Yeah. Fantastic record. You know, considered so the best there. by many ACDC fans. And I, you know, I, I would agree with that. You know, so Mark was there for this really. It wasn't like he was there for a couple of years. He was there for a long time. Played lots and lots of shows. So they brought him out. A journalist contacted him when ACDC was in town. And they said to Mark, you know, it's been a while since you've been out of the band and uh, surely it must be a difficult thing for you to see how successful they've become. And, and Mark said, I must write a book because it's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> and I thought, this is really good. And it turned out he was a friend of a friend. And I just reached out to him. I said, you really want to write a book? Let's do it together. And, you know, and he'd already started. So I got to be his ghostwriter. And through him, I just got so many great ACDC stories. I can imagine. But, um, you know, the best, uh, there's two that really stick in my mind. There's one where Mark and Bon are sharing a room and they're in Paris. This is about 1978. So they're starting to really take off internationally. And they've had a big night out with a, not just a big gig, but they've met a couple of very friendly locals. Okay. I'm going to put it that way. 
and you know they they've been on the road for six months now or whatever and they're you know that I've spent time on the road with bands and, and it's like a vacuum it's like a cocoon you know that spinal tap joke about hello Cleveland well, yeah I, I get that I can see how people after a while have no idea where they are so they get up the next morning and they've had this great they played a great gig and they met these lovely very friendly um, locals and uh, they get up and they're on one of those little balconies in a Parisian hotel room and they're looking out and there's the Eiffel Tower is just there. And Mark's sitting there with this great grin on his face thinking this is fantastic because Mark comes from the same kind of background as Keith Urban did, very working class. And Bond's looking at it for eight, looking out for ages. And Mark said, what's up, mate? And he said, you know, it's really funny, Mark, that tower, they've got one of those in Paris as well. <laughs> He just had no idea where he was. <laughs> and the other one, the other one's a little bit more uh, blue, shall we say. Um, yeah. Hopefully there's no, um, you know, G, this is not a G-rated show. No, it's not a G-rated show. There's um, in Australia, particularly in the 70s, you would have a tour program that you'd, you know, they still do it now, but back then it used to be a really big marketing tool. And you get, band members would get one of those standard Q&As. You know, what's your favourite drink? What's your favourite movie? What colour do you like? And, um, one of the questions on the questionnaire was, um, you know, what, what's your personal goal or who would you like to meet? And um, Mark, this was Mark's first tour with the band. And when it was published and printed, his quote was, I'd like to fuck Britt Eklund. <laughs> <laughs> now, and no one even looked at it twice. And they published it and printed it. And, you know, ACDC's audience back then, because there was a show here called Countdown, and it's like yeah. top of the pops in the UK, right? It's a pop show. ACDC were on the, almost every week and got this big teenage audience. So some kid from the show has gone home with a program and shown it to mum and dad who were completely freaked out, rang their local counsellor, get the, all these gigs were cancelled. And, of course, Mark didn't fill out the questionnaire at all. Bond filled it out for him. Ah. <laughs> and so they're sitting on the tour bus and, all this stuff is all these gigs are being cancelled, and there's all this furor, and journalists are chasing them for quotes. And Mark's sitting there, and he's devastated. He's like, Oh man, what's happened to me? I'm gonna get kicked out of the band. This is terrible. And he's sitting on the bus feeling absolutely distraught. And Bond sat down next to him, and Mark's thinking, Oh, okay, he's gonna come clean. It's all gonna be fine, you know, because Bond was slightly older than the other guys, too. So he was sort of sort of seen as the senior member of the band. Bond sat down with him and looked at him and said, ah, oh, it's a tough time, Mark. But, you know, the girl does have feelings too and then walked away. <laughs> <laughs> he just couldn't own it. He just couldn't do it. Oh, man. But, you know, that goes back to the whole kind of larrikin thing that I was talking right. about. You it's know, a prankster. It's, it's a prankster. Some people can get away with it and some people can't. And Bond could. You know. Interesting quote in the article I read. You said it, if he'd lived, I don't think the band would still be around today. Why do you feel mm. that way? Mm. I think he would have he would have seen, I don't think he would have appreciated being or, or had any desire to be an aging rock star. You know, when he died, well, he was more than, you know, he was more in, in he was 100% invested in the band. I don't think he would have put in more than another 10 years or so. Um, I think he would have gone, he was a guy who liked his creature comforts too. I think when he, if he'd been around to make his first million, he would have been happy with that. And I don't mm. think he, he, there's no way he would be, you know, we talked about the Stones before. There's no way he would have been out front of that band at 80 years old. It just, it, was, it would be an idea that he would have laughed out of town. Do you think he would still make music though? Would he be recording? Oh, possibly. I, I see him more, I would have seen him more as a Tonight Show kind of guy, you know, Tonight with Bond, Late Night with Bond, right. you know. He'd have all his friends around. It'd be the best TV show you could ever imagine. You know, he could invite all these great acts to perform and he'd just be on the couch just cracking wise with people. You know, I think that would have been more his line. And he was a smart guy. He was well-read. You know, he might have got into a whole bunch of other things. But I, I do think that the idea of an a being an ageing rock star had no appeal for him whatsoever. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. Two other extremely important names in ACDC history who are sadly no longer with us. George Young and Malcolm Young, brothers of mm. Angus. George yeah. produced the early ACDC albums, Malcolm the rhythm guitarist of ACDC, but more than just that, you, oh, wrote, yeah. a book, you wrote a book uh, called uh, Friday on My Mind, The Life of George Young. That came out in 2020. Can you talk about his importance to Australian rock music and ACDC? Sure. 
Yeah, George is royalty. George uh, Young and Harry Vander, they were together in a band called the Easy Beats. Uh, Easy Beats, you know, Friday on My Mind was a huge hit in, the, in 65, 66. They were the first Australian band to ever have international success with an original song. You know, that was a really big, big moment. Both immigrants uh, met in a met at an immigration centre in Sydney at a time when you know post-war immigration was really booming. George, in particular, you know he's like the founding father. You know, the Easy Beats went overseas. They spaced themselves in the UK. They toured America. Uh, they had this one great song and made a bunch of really interesting records. But it didn't happen for them again because, as George later said, we tried too much. We tried to be, we saw the Beatles and went, well, they're doing it. We should do it too. The reality was their best songs were the ones that were really simple and basic. You know, the hits that they had here, songs like Sorry and, uh, and uh, Wedding Ring and so on, these early songs that were really raw and rootsy and bluesy and just short, sharp, two and a half minute songs. They were going to make these, went on to make these quite big orchestrated epics, you know, great music, but it just didn't, it wasn't representative of what they really were. So anyway, the Easy Beats fell apart. I mean, you know, there's terrible stories. They they had all this international acclaim and their final tour, you know, they ended up playing to a half-empty room out in rural Australia. No one was there. And at the end of it all, I think they pocketed $500 each. Here's thanks for the last, you know, six years. It's been great. This is yeah. basically all it's achieved for you. George spent a few years in England working with his partner, Harry Vander. Um, they came back to Australia. At this time, Malcolm and Angus... Uh, weren't in a band together. Malcolm was in a band called, the, oddly enough, the Velvet Underground, a, a Sydney band, not the one with Lou and John Cale. But he was sort of a, a, a hired hand, and he'd seen the success. Malcolm and Angus just – George wasn't their brother. He was their idol. You know, what he'd achieved internationally with the Easy Beats was unfathomable. Again, we're talking about real working-class guys, guys who came over as immigrants who were high school dropouts. I think Angus had worked in a uh, – no, sorry, Malcolm had worked in the bra factory for a little while. <laughs> and Angus had worked packing pornographic magazines. Yeah. These eight, guys were not... There's eight children, right? Their parents oh, yeah, had yeah. Eight Big family. Children. Big family. Because there was this scheme, post-war scheme here called uh, what we call colloquially the 10-pound POM. And it meant for 10 pounds, which was about 20 bucks, you could bring your family out from the UK and, base, and live in Australia, get a job and start again, you know. And for anybody who'd lived through World War II, particularly in England, God, you want to get the hell out of there and come to this, you know, strange, sunny place at the bottom of the world, which is how come we had so many, we have so many great musicians here because so many of them came through this scheme. Anyway, so, yeah, big family. Um, George had finally come back to Australia in the early 70s at the time that Malcolm said to Angus, let's form our own band, let's do our own thing, and which led to ACDC. Early on, George sat down with them and said, look, you know, they'd started to develop their sound. You know, this raw, again, something that came out like Keith Urban, came out of the Aussie beer barns and uh, uh, was a really primal, hard rocking, hard hitting kind of sound. And they said to George, you know, should we try other things? Should we you know, write ballads? I don't know, folk songs. And George said, no, 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 don't make the mistakes that we made in the Easy Beats. You've got your sound. Focus on it. And, you know, let's face it, they've been doing the same thing for almost 50 years now. So it's worked. it was great advice. And then, you know, he was their early producer. He produced everything up until Highway to Hell, I think, which was the first record with uh, Mutt Lang. So, you know, he was there as, they span, as this band found their sound, developed their sound and established themselves internationally. He was the guy that Malcolm and Angus would always go back to for advice, not just musical advice, but career advice, because George said to them, don't make the mistakes we made in the Easy Beats. Keep control of your records. Know, know who your publisher is. Know, you know, they, they, I worked with Michael Browning, who was their first manager, and they sacked him as soon as big international managers started sniffing around because Malcolm and Angus knew that that was how they were going to get exposed globally. They needed the heavyweights behind them which George didn't do with the Easy Beats. So it was almost like, you know, everything that George had, all the mistakes that George had made, he said to Malcolm and Angus, okay, don't do this because we did it. <laughs> right. Do something different. You know, we made these mistakes, don't repeat them. So he became a real guru, a real sage for the band. And they brought him back. They brought him and Harry Vander back much later on to produce later records. I think they did Stiff Up a Lip together, you know. Yeah. And it was one of the last productions that George did before he died. 
as far as Malcolm's concerned, yeah, Malcolm was all, ACDC was always Malcolm's band. You know, Malcolm was Malcolm's idea to form the band. It was Malcolm's idea to bring Angus in. Initially, you know, he was with older musicians who George knew and then eventually connected, you know, with uh, Phil Rudd, Mark Evans, you know, the right guys. They got the uh, the right guys and Bon Scott, of course. They got the right guys, their classic lineup. But it was always Malcolm making the big decisions, hiring, firing, right. you know, what songs to record, where to record them. But, you know, there was never a question up until the point of working with Mutt Lang who they were going to record them with. It was always going to be George Young and Harry Vander and it was always going to be back in Sydney at a studio called Albert's, which is now a parking lot, man, and it should be a oh, freaking really? sh- it should be a shrine. Oh, you know, God. it should it's our Abbey Road. You know, yeah. so much great music was made there. So, um, but, but yeah, the, so, the title of your book is apt: Malcolm Young, the man who made ACDC. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah, yeah. Says well, you it know, all. It's, the ACDC thing is really interesting because you know a lot of people will say, "Hang on, they're Scottish." You know, hang on. Brian Johnson's been in the band longer than than uh, Bon Scott, and all those are valid comments. But I'm interested in roots. I'm interested in you know most of the stories and the books that I write. The the most intense part of those biographies will be the pre success. Where do you come from, and how did you get to where you are now? That's the stuff that really interests me. And for ACDC, if they hadn't come, if the Youngs hadn't come to Australia, we wouldn't be talking about them. There was this environment here, in this, particularly in the 70s, where bands could play seven nights a week to big crowds in big rooms and really learn their trade. You know, it's the environment that produced ACDC, it produced In Excess, it produced Midnight Oil, Hoodoo Gurus, all these great bands that came out of that time came out of this pub circuit. And I think if ACDC hadn't been exposed to that, they wouldn't exist. You know, we wouldn't be talking about them. And that book came out in 2019, by the way. Got to plug that one. Malcolm Young, the man who made ACDC. Another legacy band would be Red Hot Chili Peppers. 2004, you wrote a book called Fornication, the Red Hot Chili Peppers story. Mm. Best-selling biography of the band, by the way. And I know, one- until Peters wrote his book, damn him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Flea his wrote a book. Sold, his book has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. I mean, that's a hugely – I think it's sold more copies than about the last three or four Chili Peppers records combined. Expectations as an author. What's a good number? Like what's a – 10,000. Like, well, because you say 10, yeah. Oddly, the most successful book I've had that I uh, – had bigger successes as a ghostwriter, but uh, the Angus book, that sold about 20,000 copies, you know. Yeah. And, and internationally, that's they're great numbers, you know. They, and to be honest, I thought the Bond book was better. <laughs> but, you know, right. what do I know? I'm, I'm just yeah. the author. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say like 5,000 is like the equivalent of like a gold record. 10,000 yeah. is a platinum record, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the publisher of the Keith Urban books got high expectations, and I, I get that because he's I'm got sure. such a big audience. So, you yeah, know, yeah. fingers crossed. But my books tend to do in Australia, tend to do around 10, 15,000, which is great. Yeah, that's so, awesome. You know. Blood Sugar Sex Magic from 91 may be their... It may be their best album, but they, Chili Peppers have so many great ones. But that was supposed to be a double album? Yeah, I was surprised too when I started researching that. They recorded so much. I mean, it was probably the first time, to be honest, that they had their shit together, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. You know, I got a story. I think it was from Cliff Martinez or, or Jack Sherman. I think it was Cliff Martinez told me about recording, you know, in Detroit with George Clinton. That was, what, freaky styly. And, you know, he said we, we'd we never been, we hadn't spent much time in Detroit. And we couldn't work out why there was all this earthenware stuff for sale everywhere. It's the crack pipes, man. Everybody, crack was an epidemic, you know, and young guys in, in a studio with George Clinton and probably a reasonable amount of money, you know, where most of that went. I think by the time they got together with Rick Rubin, you know, they knew that they had to take this seriously. Uh, they recorded, I think it was like 25 songs. There's a bunch of covers. There was that song Soul oh, to really? Squeeze, which came yes, out later yes, on. Yes, that was, came out. Not, surprisingly not on the record, to be honest. Generally speaking, I, I okay, well, when I'm writing a book, I'm investing a lot of myself for 12 months at least in listening to not just the music, but reading everything I can, talking to as many people I, as I can, kind of immersing myself in their world. I've got to be honest, when I'd finished the Chili Peppers book, I was happy to walk away from it. Really? There's some really, yeah, there's some really heavy fuel there, particularly Anthony Kiedis. I think he runs on some really, and I, I don't mean this, this is not a negative comment, it's just an observation, is that guys like that, and I think Keith Richards might have a bit of it too, they run on 
like really heavy fuel. It's hard to explain. They, the band is their obsession. Mm. And it, in Keatus's play instance, it was probably because, you know, his father was a nasty piece of work and he came from some pretty sordid background and, you know, it was his baby and he wanted, and, you know, he's still doing it now, but it meant a lot of people suffered along the way. Like Hilla Slovak was dead. John Frusciante might as well have been dead after, oh, you know, blood sugar. You know, he, he was as good as dead. There's the video um, of him when he was at yeah. his worst. And it, yeah, yeah, it was Flea. Flea saved that guy's life, yeah. man. You know, if, if it wasn't for Flea's support, because when he, when Frusciante, you know, I think it happened in Japan, he fell apart. I remember interviewing the manager, Lindy Getz, and he said, yeah, he just crumbled like a cookie. He just fell apart. You know, it was drugs and it was pressure and it was success. And it was money and all these kind of things came together. And yeah, you see footage from that time. I mean, he was a terrible wreck, you know, oh, yeah. but Flea hung in there. Flea, I think was the only one in the band who really supported him uh, oh. and more power to him. And he, you know, got him back in because he also knew that for Shady, to me was the spark, you know, creatively, he's the magic in that band. Oh yes. Yeah. And such a great guitarist and such so great with melodies. Um, Every time he's in the band, they make great records, and every time he's out, they make a flop. You know, work that one out. But yeah, it was something about writing about them. I thought I'm, I'm done. I've never revisited that book. I probably it's well overdue for an update, but I just I just don't think I want to get back into that world because it was I found it a bit just a bit heavy. Yeah, it's a real tragedy there. It's a real not just death, but you know, people whose careers have been ruined, and you know, uh, it it just I don't know. It just felt sort of it was almost like there was some kind of curse i don't know what it was it just yeah it just felt weird yeah 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 and you know you can tell how i how best put this you could tell that that band was being driven by something more than just you know the desire for success it was like without that band particularly people like Kitas, you know you've got to wonder what they're going to hang on to you know right right yeah Tell me about the Cure because I would think maybe this was the band. Oh, no. some, was, this is although, my... you, know, you know, I spent a lot of time with Lowell Tolhurst. And, yeah, um, yeah, for, to write the, 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 the 2005 book, by the way, the story of yeah, Never the Enough, cure, the story of the Cure. Yeah, that's right. right. And uh, Lowell, I noticed, has just written a new book on goth. So, you know, yeah. he's getting around. But his experience that he related to me was that was pretty dark. You know, alcoholism. Again, you know, guys that came from a very – blue collar kind of background who had all this great success and, and weren't quite sure how to deal with it. Lowell in particular. He was kind but of like Robert, the Brian Jones of the band phased yeah, out, that's, right? Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. Well, I think, I think he got a push, but Lowell was ready to jump anyway, I think. Yeah. And yeah, I think he, he, he could see what was going on with himself and how bad it was. And, you know, he knew that he needed help, but you know, he's been invited back into the band for various anniversaries and so on since so obviously he's still got a really good relationship with robert smith which is great. that's great to hear yeah because it did kind of it was kind of an ugly end there like they, he was on drums he was part of the songwriting process then he's kind of not anymore and, and then keyboard, on, yeah. yeah disintegration he's kind of like you know let's just throw him a bone and put him on the keyboards it's like it was weird yeah well, well no... i remember doing you know speaking to him about that and he said disintegration was the perfect title because that's exactly what was happening to me right. at the time yeah. you know so, you know but you know, he's a survivor. Uh, Robert Smith is the ultimate survivor. You know, I didn't really, I didn't spend any time with him. Uh, he was the only one that was resistant or, or was unavailable. I managed to speak to everybody else. But I would say he's someone, again, who the band, the, the, that thing, the cure, the brand, the cure is his lifeline. That's his, not his reason for being, but it's a, the most central part of his life. What is it about Robert Smith because there's so many lineup changes, people mm. leaving, coming back. Simon Gallup has really, he's been there most of the time, but even he had a falling out with Robert, even yeah, though they were like best out. men at each other's wedding. Or whatever. But what is it about Robert? Is he, is he difficult to work with? Is he a perfectionist? Is he, what, what's, the, what's the reason for all the... I think he's one of those guys who would expect everybody involved with his band, and it is his band, to be as dedicated as he is as completely obsessive about it as he is and it's probably you probably couldn't say that about all the other guys you know yeah they probably have, you know i don't think i don't think robert has kids or anything like that you know the cure is his no. baby you yeah. know so i would think that was the problem is that you know he would expect a certain level of, it's like fleetwood mac 
you know, when Lindsay Buckingham said, you know, oh, I've got my own solo record and I don't want to tour. Well, to Mick Fleetwood, that would be blasphemy. It's like, you want to do what? Right. You Nick know? is that way too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you invest in Mick Fleetwood's case. What is it? 50 years. Well, it's the same with Robert Smith. Actually, with Mick Fleetwood, it's closer to 60, isn't it? My God. Yeah. 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 Around yeah I remember Stevie Nick saying, you know, Mick is, he's the guy, man, that he keeps this band going because he kept them going through the lean years when they were playing clubs in the early 90s before the big reunion. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, you know, you go back to the late 60s too, Jeez. when, you know, they had more members in that band than they you would have. You could make a couple of soccer teams out of the members, ex-members of Fleetwood Mac. You know, there was so yeah. many. And, and weird stories, you know, uh, Peter Green, you know, finding God, someone else finding LSD, you know, and going off on these weird um, tangents where they just didn't just drop out of Fleetwood Mac. They dropped out of life. Yes. You know, they just disappeared. So again, there's a band that was probably running on some pretty heavy fuel too at certain times. Well, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in getting your thoughts now, because you've written books on the Finn brothers mm. and Neil Finn. You wrote a book yeah. on Neil Finn too. So what do you think of Neil Finn and, and Fleetwood Mac? Like, how do you, how do you like that? Well, this side of the, the, the planet, it was a complete shock. Yeah. You know, it was like, a, I think Neil put out a tweet. It said something about uh, mysteries of Stonehenge revealed. And yes, I am joining Fleetwood Mac, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what? But as I dug into it for my book, it turns out that him and Mick were friends. Mick, Mick had been with the, uh, the traditional, the classic version of Fleetwood Mac in New Zealand a few years ago on tour, met Neil at an award show, and they just clicked. You know, a couple of old troopers, you know, probably swapping war stories about life on the road. And they just found they became really good friends. Uh, Mick had worked with Neil on a couple of solo projects. He said, yeah, can you just come in and play some drums? No problem. And then when the whole, you know, shit fight with Lindsay Buckingham occurred before this last tour, as soon as Buckingham said, I'm not in, um, you know, Mick Flew would immediately thought, I'll get Neil. And Mike Campbell, of course. You know, yeah, he's telling, though, that they needed two people to replace one. But, uh, you know, that's another story. But um, Neil, they were friends. Um, and I think for Neil, it was just like, what is, you know, a bizarre possibility, you know, to go and play with such a big band? Because Crowded House, for all their success and split ends, they weren't playing to 50,000 people each night. Fleetwood Mac do. And, you know, to have that experience, that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to be able to do that. So I could understand why he did it. The money would have been fantastic, as I understand. He bought a house in L.A. with the proceeds. Ooh, good um, for him. Yeah, well done. Him. Did, and did they play the, Don't Dream It's Over? Did they yeah. include Crowded House tunes on that? Fleet this is the big yeah. thing. This is the big thing. You know, this is a band who could play for three hours and every song's a hit to crowds of 50,000 and upwards who are just – you know, worshipping at the the house of Fleetwood Mac. And Mick has said to Neil, I want you to do Don't Dream It's Over. And on some nights he did um, I Got You as well. He said, I, I'm going to give you your own spot. And Stevie Nicks would join him and they'd perform together. And that was one of the highlights of the shows, you know. So it says eons about the respect that Neil has from fellow musicians and also, you know, about the simple power of that that particular song, Don't Dream It's Over. You know, it's a... It's an anthem. It's a oh, universal what a anthem. song! Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an across the universe. It's one of those songs that just connects with everybody. Um, uh, you know, I, I always like. I'm not a musician, but if I was, and I could be given ten songs that I'd like to claim, you know, have, as having written, that'd be one of them. So you Great know, song. It, it says so much that every night Mick would say, "Right, here's Neil spot," and then it wasn't just Neil solo. Stevie Nicks would join him. You know, it was it was really powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, what are they going to do now with Christine? McVeigh gone. I mean, I think again, going back to the Mick Fleetwood, the, the the idea that he can't go on without Fleetwood Mac. So I think he's gonna he's gonna it's bring him weird, back. It's a weird one, isn't it? It's it's ACDC without Malcolm. You know, it's it's a it's a strange situation. Whether they went they went on without her before. Remember when she retired? Yeah, she, that's true. She, she retired, didn't, didn't she? Didn't like yeah. flying. She was just done, and she came back. Yeah, it's weird. I I don't know. I mean, I think Neil would be in the mix. But then again, I would imagine Lindsay Buckingham would probably say to honor Christine, he'd want to do something himself. So, yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I honestly, I couldn't comment professionally. I could only just pass a personal kind of observation would be if they, if for some reason they wanted to go back to this, this lineup, including Neil, um, you know, and Lindsay Buckingham said, no, Neil would definitely be in the mix. Yeah. Damn, Mike Campbell. 
my favorite guitarist. Man. Oh, yeah. Have him in your band. You're doing okay. And and not a bad songwriter. Born yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah. He sort of lived in Tom Petty's shadow a little bit, yeah. didn't he? The Booked on Rock podcast will be back after this. I want to plug all your books here. We want to try to get to a few more. You got the Dave Grohl story from 06. I mentioned the Finn brothers, the story of the Finn brothers. Together Alone, Split Ends, Crowded House, and Beyond. And then you have Don't Dream It's Over, the first biography to focus exclusively on Neil Finn. And what else? Well, you got the Jeff Buckley book. Jeff Buckley. Yeah, Jeff Two Buckley of them, had... right? Two books. Yeah, actually. well, I, I mean, I, I had the original book and I got the rights back and I rewrote it. And I did a book with uh, the photographer, Mary Sear, as well. I was involved with the Jeff Buckley, Tim Buckley tour here in Australia with Gary Lucas. Um, yeah, there's something about, particularly with Australia, Jeff Buckley, you know, he wasn't around for a long time. but he Right, that's Australia. what I was going to ask you. What is it that these musicians who have such respect for him, he made one album? Sadly dies there's young. A, there's a really powerful connection in Australia for Jeff Buckley. Um, he toured here twice, you know, and he wasn't, it wasn't like he was on the road for a long time. You know, the guy was 30 when he died. But um, there was great radio support here in Australia. Um, there's sort of alternative radio that gets big coverage here, a station called Triple J, which comes out of Sydney, but is a nationwide station. And, is, you know, it's the station that all international tourists will go to immediately once they reach Sydney. You know, they'll go on play a set in the studio or be interviewed on air and triple J because it has such influence. You know, it's like a, a cross between, I don't know, NPR and, you know, whatever your coolest alternative station is, you know, it's got that reach. And, um, you know, he, he did sets with them and that got really great coverage and suddenly the shows are full and he's booking more shows. There was something about obviously his voice, his on stage charisma Ladies loved him. (laughs) There were amazing stories about the queues of women waiting to see Jeff after shows in Australia. You know, there's also great. I got told the story. The you got to understand in Australia, the pub culture is pretty strong. When you play live, if you're not playing in a theater or an arena, you're playing in a pub, and you know, people's time is divided between watching the band and getting drinks. In one venue that Jeff played in. They turned off the bar. They turned off the cash register while he was playing. And in Australia, that's the biggest accolade you could ever imagine, right? We don't, we don't want to think about anything except the guy on stage. You know, I've never heard of that happening before. So he just connected really powerfully with an audience here. A lot of stuff happened to him here. The band that he was in, you know, with Mick Grundle and uh, Matt Johnson and, and M- Michael Ty, it fell apart in Australia. That second tour, by the end of that, they were done. Matt Johnson... He didn't even last the final show. My understanding is he just got up from his drum kit, walked out the door while they were playing, mm. didn't come back. You know, things, again, things got quite heavy. Um, I think there was a lot of music industry people kind of circling and buzzing around Jeff. You know, he was going to be this superstar, you know. But in Australia, the connection was much more pure. You know, people just really related to his music and his performances. And, and um, you know, when he died, I mean, it was, that was Kurt Cobain level here. You know, that right. was... You know, it was big news. Accidental drowning. Really, yeah. It was, it was yeah. seen as a great tragedy. And people still talking about him here 25 years down the line, you know. Hmm. Um, you know, even last year there was another. Gary Lucas came out and was playing Jeff Buckley songs again, you know. So, Amazing. you know, that was this year. So, you know, it's pretty strong, the connection here. So for me to write about him, it, it wasn't it, – it was interesting because I got to write about that Australian experience quite yeah. strongly. So one I, al- one like, album, 1994's Grace. One album. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, even Hendrix recorded half a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> and then that mess of the second record, which, you know, should never have been released. You know, it had some good moments, but it should never have been. It's called what? Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. That's the posthum- first posthumous gotcha. record that was, he was working on when he died, and it wasn't ready. Grace sold something like half a million copies here in Australia, which is just staggering numbers. I understand Australia and France were his two biggest audiences. Yeah, well, and here in the States, I hear a lot about him too. I mean, there, there are musicians in the States that have such respect for him. And the, the two books you wrote, 2016's A Pure Drop, The Life of Jeff Buckley, and then there's 25 Years of Grace, an anniversary tribute to Jeff Buckley. That was in 20- Yeah, that's more, that's more about Mary C's photography, gotcha. which, um, okay. you know, just my words are just wrapped around these beautiful images. My God, the book is just stunning. I'll send you a copy. It's fantastic. Oh, that'd be nice, man. Thank you. So the first and only definitive biography of country music star Keith Urban's out now through Citadel Books. 
You can find it wherever books are sold. And where can people find you online, Jeff? You have a website, I think. I do. Yes. Uh, it's just Jeff Apter, J-E-F-F-A-P-T-E-R dot com dot A-U. Add the A-U at the end for Australia. Right. I'm looking at it here, and it's got all yeah. your books, so people can pick up copies of all the books there. Yeah. Yeah, look, and I'm, I'm, you can email me. Uh, compliments are welcome. Insults. Uh, we, we, you know, it's like <laughs> As long as they're uh, respectfully worded, right. you know, I'm, I'm open to that. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, offers of money, um, you know, professional services. I'm here for you. You know, how many books on all have you written? Uh, I off think the I've top of 30. your head, wow, um, thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's. There's a funny thing here in Australia. When whenever you write a new book, my publisher sends me a questionnaire. Right, you fill it in, and the first question is, "What is your profession?" <laughs> because <laughs> in Australia, it's really hard to make a living as a writer. It's real. I mean, it's, it's, I think anywhere, a, you know, I think that's a, a, a localized phenomenon. I think there's the same all around the world. It's hard. So I take on a lot of projects. Um, I take on ghostwriting projects. I've worked with a number of different people as a ghostwriter. And I really love it because it's so different to writing under my own name. It's, it's a totally different process. Writing under your own name is the lead guitar, man. You're out front, right? Right. Ghostwriter, you're a rhythm guitar. You might even be the bass player. You know, you're in the band. You're just keeping the beat. And you've got to just make sure you get to the finish line. So it's a totally different experience. And I really enjoy it. Thanks, man. This was so great. And I hope to have you back on again down the line, because I'm assuming you will have more books to talk Eric, about. Next time we'll be Mano Mano in the studio together. Okay. Ooh, that'd be cool. I've got reason. I can't wait to get back. Actually, I want to come back and have a look at some of the places that, uh, you know, my wife and I spent a bit of time in and where we got married and, you know, uh, we used to go up to Toad's Place all the time. Toad's in Place in New Haven. Haven. Yes. Man, and I saw. Place. I saw. I'm thinking. I saw Chris Whitley play there. I saw Pat Benatar play there. Pat Benatar was. You know how the stage is really low. You couldn't see Pat Benatar because she's so short. <laughs> yeah, I was standing. Going, Where is she? I know. I can hear her. I uh, saw Frank Black played there. I saw some great. The Stones surprise up. gig there in 1989. Yeah, Dylan's played there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such. Yeah, because when you go great... in, you see all the pictures of the artists who've been there. You know, George. Thurber, yeah, and it's just a great there. funky room. You know, I oh, really, it's... really like. That was one of the best gigs I would go to regularly. If I wasn't going down to New York, I'd go up to Toads, you know, whoever was playing. Because it was always that, I love that, you get people before they play the big New York show. Yes. You know, so, yes. you know they're a little looser, uh, but they're also, they want to prove themselves. And you can tell they're just getting into a real good groove by the time they get to Toads. Place. Uh, yeah, and it's great because there's some great stories from people that, that I, well, I've been there many times, but I my cousin Andy told me a story. He went to, he, a friend of his says, Hey, we're going to see. Uh, we're going to go and see Beck, and he thought it was Jeff Beck. So he gets there, and it's Beck. You know, but this is like pre-fame Beck. Where's his guitar, man? But the Beck happens to be sitting out there, be pre-show, okay? But he's unknown, and he's chatting it up with my cousin. My cousin's like, I'm bummed, man. I thought I was going to see Jeff Beck, some fucking guy <laughs> named Beck. And <laughs> and Beck didn't say anything, and then my cousin goes inside, and there's the dude he was just chatting with on stage. That's so funny. That reminds that, me when we were, you know, a part of my whole experience as a writer is drawn from a lot of things that happened to me when I was a teenager. I guess it's the same for most, particularly sure. people writing about music or sport, you know. And when I was a teenager, the big gig that we used to go to before we were old enough to go into pubs was this radio station. I mentioned Triple J. They used to be called Double J when they were just in Sydney. And they used to host Tuesday night live performances in the studio. And their studio was up on the edge of King's Cross, which is the red light part of town. It's 42nd Street. It's really 42nd Street in the 70s. Okay. Get the picture. Yeah. Really, yeah. You know, and we were kids in the suburbs. We were way out in the boonies. It was like living in Long Island or somewhere where we came from. We'd leave school, go home, get changed, get on the train, go into town. And as the as our trip, it took about an hour, you know, and we'd find, we were all 15, and we'd find the oldest, the guy with the most stubble in our group would be the guy who goes into the pub before we get to the venue, you know, and he'd come out with 10 drinks, you know, while we're standing outside. Anyway, we, I remember one night we got to the show and you never knew who was going to play. It was always a surprise. And it was a live to wear gig. And we'd sit in this little studio and we're sitting there and I remember you get on the floor and there's a guy in front of me this one night he's got on this big straw hat and i remember thinking damn i hope he's not here during the gig because i can't see a thing you know this guy's straw hat is in the way so the band gets on stage plugs in the guy in front of me stands up takes off his straw hat it's peter garrett it's me <laughs> <Lord. laughs> 
and this is not this was 1976 <laughs> they were an unknown quantity then yeah. and i remember going wow firstly no one had a shaved head back in 1976. i was gonna say he's covering up that bald head <laughs> yeah, yeah and he's about eight foot tall he's like this yes. giant on the stage and midnight oil is a great band yeah and we went that was a band that we followed for years and years and years just on the strength of seeing that but i just remember sitting there going who is this guy don't get in my way man oh you're the so singer funny. yeah <laughs> All right, Jeff. Thanks, man. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Eric. Well, now, that was an adventure. That was quite a show you put on today. Well, let me just close this conversation by saying you are one unique individual.